getting serious. Uh, so welcome to uh, uh, the Hatif Vienna International Science School. Um, it's my very, very great pleasure uh, to introduce today's speaker, who is uh, Svetlana uh, Neboroda. Svetlana is a tremendous uh, mathematician uh, who uh, also hails from the city of Kharkiv um, in western, uh, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, Svetlana uh, obtained her undergraduate and master education uh, in Kharkiv. She actually has two degrees, one in applied mathematics, the other in finance. Uh, she then moved to the United States to, uh, for her graduate work. Uh, she obtained her PhD uh, from the University of Missouri. Uh, Missouri uh, and uh, she's been um, a professor at the University uh, of Minnesota uh, for many years now, and has recently moved uh, to Zurich, uh, where she is now professor at the Swiss Federal Institute uh, of Technology, that is ETH. So Svetlana is doing groundbreaking uh, research uh, that uh, brings together uh, mathematics and uh, uh, computer science in, in, in many ways. She's received any amount of uh, uh, accolades for her work. So in fact, her, um, uh, her CV is 17 pages long. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's, it's very impressive. And we are going to learn from her about localization uh, today. And uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, a new technique that she's been pioneering with her collaborators, of which her collaborators, uh, Svetlana, we have a common friend, namely Doug Arnold, uh, say that Svetlana is doing all the heavy lifting. <laughs> Svetlana, it's a pleasure to have you, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. He's too kind to me, to me you know. Everyone is doing it. Well, come on, he's the one oh, with the teddy bear. Sure. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to share the screen. I will keep it not full screen because I want to show some movies on the way, but tell me if it's no, and then I will be switching between the windows. Um, let me see if I manage to. Uh, give me one second, you guys. Uh, share screen. Um, okay, you should be seeing yourself now and hopefully not only. Okay, does it look correct to you? I don't hear you anymore, Michael, for some reason. Okay, if there are any problems, may I ask you um, if you are moderating just tell me directly without chat because there are so many messages in chat that I'll just won't be able to read them simultaneously. Will do. Thank you. Um, so as an author, I'm going to talk about a sort of big project by now devoted largely to waves and complex and disordered media. And frankly, I'll probably tell you more about the problems that we are facing than about what we actually managed to prove on the mathematical side. but. I hope it will be entertaining nonetheless. So first of all, let me say a few words about the collaboration. Um, this is something that um, uh, started as a collaboration of 10 scientists, uh, um, spanning mathematics, uh, experimental physics, uh, um, computational mathematics. You can see a website on the first page of my slides and the I, I'll send the slides afterwards, so if anyone is interested, you can um, go and look more at the work of the collaboration. Um, so as I have mentioned, we have people in uh, pure mathematics, uh, in uh, experimental physics and theoretical physics, uh, in applied mathematics, just mentioned Doug Arnold um, on the slide. And uh, in the past uh, four years, the collaboration has grown to about 60 to 70 researchers all over the world, in Paris and Geneva, in uh, United Kingdom, uh, in Switzerland now, um, in the United States, of course. 
Um, this is a, actually an incomplete <laughs> list of all the uh, people involved at this point. And in particular, our PIs have just gotten both field medal and Nobel Prize. I'm very happy to report this in 2023. Yoga Yuminir got the field medal for advances in preparation of statistical physics, the um, sort of mathematical side of statistical physics. And uh, Alana Speer got the Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, for the experiments with entanglement. Both of them have been principal investigators in the project for quite some time now. Um, but with that, let me uh, switch a bit to the content of the project. And actually, I want to start with the question that I've been asked all too often by, um, in particular, by high school students who are interested in research, what the research in mathematics actually is. Um, are there any theorems left to prove? Don't we know everything by now? Um, as a matter of fact, it's uh, more relevant mathematics and the progress in mathematics is more relevant than ever because basically at the scales that we are capable of operating right now in terms of experiment and in terms of technology, um, one cannot deal with the problems without mathematics anymore. The experiments are all too costly and all too precise, and you sort of get lost in this um, immense arrays of, uh, you know, huge arrays of data without the guiding principles of mathematics. Um, so for instance, um, Alana Spad that I have just mentioned on the previous slide, and I will press winner from 2023, he deals with the, he uh, works with the experiments with cold data. Cold means really cold. This is a few degrees above absolute zero. And it's absolutely unimaginable, but physicists can handle right now individual atoms with tweezers, literally individual ones, um, at, uh, you know, at nano Kelvin. But they also cannot afford the mistake because every experiment costs, you know, half a million to a million of dollars. And when you are handling individual atoms, you really need a precision of sort of an a priori precision of theorems to actually be able to predict what you're going to get, to be able to have an educated experiment. Otherwise, you will not just randomly get the correct answer or the answer that you are looking for. Another example, and um, this is um, this is the work of many, many people, but in particular, the mathematical contributions, some of the most meaningful mathematical contributions in this project are by Yves Meyer, also one of the PIs in the project, is the recent discovery of gravitational waves. So this is sort of on the other end of the spectrum. We are speaking of, uh, um, well, depending. I mean, the, the waves themselves are still, uh, you know, very small because this is, you know, in, the, in time scale. But um, simultaneously, we are speaking of gravitation, of uh, cosmology, you know, we are at a completely different scale. But yet again, you need mathematics to be able to handle this. So long story short, in this new world of, um, you know, big data and immense storage capacities, um, the computational capabilities, even of the modern computers, are still not capable of finding the essence, if you wish, in this immense array of information. You basically have arrays of numbers, 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 you know, as you can see on this picture, and how do you read them off in order to create new physics, in order to create new technology, is ironically a question to mathematicians. But, you know, all this being said, to be completely honest, we are doing it for fun. It's not really uh, that much about applications, about, you know, to many of mathematicians, it's uh, more about, I don't know, creating a world of your own. Um, contrary to physicists, perhaps, we are not trying as much to understand the existing reality, at least many of us. It's more like creating an alternative reality. It has to be coherent, it has to be correct, it has to be um, sort of inhabited with, you know, correct animals. If you announce somebody and you, you know, a bad guy has to be a bad guy and somebody who is a good guy has to be a good guy. But the point is 
it's it's correct, coherent, logical world of your own, which you can create on your own. And I have a quotation here from another field medal uh, winner, Charles Stafferman, uh, which says mathematics is like playing chess with the devil. The devil is way too superior at chess, but you might take back as many moves as you like, and the devil may not. I can see a question. Yeah, just go ahead and ask me because I- Sorry, it's I, not a question. I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we have a person who is waiting in the waiting list. So if you may look at the list, there are someone or not. Thank you. I'll, I'll let the moderators handle Thank you that. so much. Um, anyway, I personally have been, I, I have a picture here of actually uh, complex dynamics, which has very much to do with the previous lecture of Konstantin Drach from yesterday. This is one of the pictures produced by uh, the mechanisms that you saw in yesterday's lecture. Um, but I was sort of randomly lucky and uh, the results of my research, which was again for the sake of its own, were more or less immediately applied to physics and have given rise to this immense physics and engineering project that I started talking to you about just a little bit before. So let me introduce to you that one. And I'll try to go from applications, even though that's not how I came to this talk. So we're going to talk about the structure of waves. Um, when I say the word waves, um, you can imagine anything that comes to your mind. This includes mechanical waves, vibrations of breaches, for example, and uh, this is a resonance, which is actually destroying the breach. You can imagine uh, water waves, fluid, electromagnetic waves, which define our everyday existence, acoustic waves, of course, gravitational waves that I just mentioned, or even matter waves. From the vantage point of today's quantum physics, we can see stuff waves. Every particle sort of in, in part a wave, and um, the world is represented as a collection of waves. The localization itself, which is the effect I will be talking about, is uh, not, it hasn't been discovered recently. Um, it's, it goes back to at least Philip Anderson in the uh, in 1950s. But what makes the project relevant today is the fact that, as I have already mentioned, the technology can finally explore the materials at the atomic scales. Uh, we have had some tremendous theoretical advances, which is um, sort of where I, um, my research comes in. And finally, uh, uh, the world is full of the game-changing new devices right now, the revolution in technology. I mean, LEDs, energy saving, organic, non-organic semiconductors that I will be talking about. So everything comes together and everything needs an understanding of the behavior and waves in disorder. Why? Well, because at these scales, when you are trying to look at the material atom by atom, you actually can see disorder at every single one. So for instance, um, here in the middle of the picture, you can see a result of an atom prop tomography. So this is a mapping of the indium gallium nitride semiconductor atom by atom, billions of atoms at a time. And what you can see here, I'll show you a bigger picture, is uh, something like this. You can see disorder at every possible level. The composition is sort of mixed and random. The um, boundaries of the quantum layers are, so the geometry is disordered as well. Secretly, the dielectric constant is also showing some disorder. And in the organic semiconductors, you can see even a topological disorder so that it's not atom by atom anymore. You have molecules, you have topology, as you can see in this mock-up picture downstairs. And now you could see, well, I mean, this looks reasonably uniform from distance what a little bit disorder can do to a perfectly healthy LED. Well, let's discuss it, but let's first discuss how you think the waves should look. And I know I'm jumping ahead here a little bit. Some people would have seen partial differential equations, some not, but I'll try to be gentle here. All waves are described by the wave equation. 
the simplest version of it is that you have so you have a function u which gives you wave the displacement it's a function of the variables time and space active space and t is time and the point is that the second derivative in t is equal to the second derivative in x. if you haven't seen partial differential equations yet it just means that you are differentiating in t ignoring x and on the right hand side you are differentiating in x ignoring t so this is sort of a discovery of the uh, uh, about 200 years ago that all uh, solutions to wave equations can be represented as um, the so-called Fourier modes as the eigenfunctions as the standing waves. The important part is that what you actually have to understand is to understand the behavior of waves are solutions to the system that you can see over here. And here only x is remaining. So you have second derivative in x. Again, it's an ordinary differential equation at this point, equals times some constant times the function itself. These are so-called standing waves, and the solutions is what you can see here. Standing means that it sort of stands in the same place rather than goes forward. And the ones which go forward are combinations, just sums and differences of this one. What you are looking for are two things. There are two things which are described in the behavior of the waves in the system. One of them is, of course, the eigenfunction itself, as I will call them, eigenfunctions, eigenmodes, standing waves, the solutions. And the other thing is this constant, which we call eigenvalues or energies. So you are looking for the constant lambda n, which I will also call energies, and for the eigenfunction. In the case of a vibrations of the string that you can see here, when you are just imagining a guitar string, this is reasonably easy. The solutions are science and cosine. If you don't believe me, just do the, you know, those of you who have seen derivatives in principle right now, you take the first derivative of, I don't know, cosine, you get sine, you get the second derivative, you get cosine back. So that's why the second derivative is equal to lambda times the same cosine. This is why these are the same solutions. Same with sine. So long story short, for a vibrating string, the solutions are just sines and cosines of increasing frequency. So you can see them here. The first one is just the sigma. The, the second one, you know, vibrates up and down. The uh, third one, you know, goes in, in a little bit more complex pattern and so on and so forth. If you have a dimension two, but still, you know, a rectangle, so I would just talked about the screen. Now I'm going to talk about rectangle, but really rectangle proper, like right in. You have a very similar picture, and it's not difficult once you start studying partial differential equations. You now have product of sines and cosines, meaning that it looks like a sign in one direction, it looks like a sign in another direction. But largely, you know, the picture is the same as what you imagine in dimension one. So this is what the standing waves look like. You know, they adjust and, and the next one will be a little, you know, with a bit bigger frequency, something like that and so on and so forth. And that's why they're standing. They're sort of as though they're pins in places. They just go up and down. But the overall pattern is the same. You know, they're sort of the same all over. You know, if you had a longer screen, it would still be looking the very same way. The problem is, in disorder, the situation is very different. So now we are speaking of the Schrodinger equation. Again, I won't be introducing the details, but you have a potential behind the system. And if it's constant or if there is no potential, then it's exactly what I have just showed you, sines and cosines, and you have these waves going through or you know just being plain. If you have a smooth potential, the situation is distorted, but not so much. So it's not anymore like perfect signs and cosines, but almost. But if you have disorder, if you have a random potential, then like, like the ones that we want to study, like the ones I started from, then the situation is different phenomenologically, whether it's in terms of mathematics or in terms of physics. In terms of mathematics, you will get exponents rather than sines and cosines. So before you got this sines and cosines going up and down, and now you get exponents which go sharp down away from the um, main part where they're related. So the standing waves actually look like the ones you can see over here. 
And in terms of physics, a former conductor would become an insulator because if you start the signal from the left hand side, the cosine or sine wave will actually carry it through. But the exponential wave will not be able to. It, it stops. It's, uh, it, 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 do, it doesn't go through, as you can see on this picture. So instead of what used to be a conductor, you actually have an insulator. So this is the phenomenon of localization. This is what we are trying to understand. And now you would tell me, you know, like what's the, um, why, why is this important other than for the curiosity of it all? Well, these are the major materials in modern application. So mathematically, we still don't understand how localization happens or does not. In particular, the picture that I showed you over here. So look for, look for example, this potential. So potential is sort of your background um, data of the system. It's what you can measure. It's what you know about your material. So however you want to imagine it. Um, for the purposes of this lecture, I'm typically thinking of the ones which are like zero, one. So one is the black part, zero is white part. So this is your data. Now I'm looking and wave. So basically you are imagining something like New York and this is the map of buildings and black are the buildings and white are the streets. So think like that. And now you are rolling through New York, but you are not you, it's a wave. And the question is whether it would make it from left to right, in a sense. And this is what's happening in conducting materials. The answer it might or might not. Both of these are examples of waves in this system. This is one of them, which is very localized. This is one of them, which it looks more or less like a previous sine and cosine. And even more complex is sort of the topology of what is happening, but I will not be talking about this too much today. Why is it important for applications? Well, let me give you an example. In 2017, the US Department of Energy um, has announced the following program to be achieved by 2035. 2035 is soon from the point of your scientific progress. Um, they hope for a 50% improvement in the LED efficiency by 2035, which is energy savings of more than 92 one gigawatt power plants. Uh, if you can't imagine what is a one gigawatt power plant, which I can't, it's something like this. So it's 3,000 million photovoltaic panels. Um, 333 wind turbines, 2,000 Corvettes, 100 million LEDs. I mean, you, you a lot of horsepower, let me put it this way. But the important information is that US has about 1,100, 1,000 gigawatts power production today. So what I'm showing you, if we manage to overcome the scientific difficulties, is a savings of about 10% of US power by 2035, of total US power. And you know, if you prefer this current the cumulative US cost savings of $890 billion by 2035. Although to be honest to me, 101 gigawatt power plants is more imaginable than $890 billion. So <laughs> depends on your taste. But either way, we have to overcome um, the major scientific challenges, and I'll be talking about this a little bit later. This includes the green gap, uh, the efficiency group at high currents, and mainly the lack of accurate computations. Because basically, at this scale, so, you know, billions of atoms at the time, three dimensional system, we are trying to understand the behavior of waves. A single computer experiment takes a month with all the modern computational power. And you really cannot use a month per experiment for making scientific progress. This is not a trial and error level. So yet again, you need mathematics. And the semiconductors look like this. So you need mathematics in this order. Another example to keep in mind is from a completely different world. You know, we talked about semiconductors, we talked about quantum physics. This could be possibly, we talked about mechanical vibration. 
One example of actually mechanical vibrations is acoustics. So the distribution of your voice when I'm speaking of my voice, well, mine is partially live because you are using Wi-Fi, but um, from me to my computer, this is a mechanical vibration. The acoustics is a mechanical vibration. So in particular, the question of stopping the waves, for example, if you want to create a noise abatement pole on the highway, is a question of being able to localize vibration coming from the sound. And indeed, what you can see on this picture is a couple of examples of localization, which um, have made it all the way to the creation of the noise abatement pole, which you can see over here. This is a real noise abatement pole on the highway around Paris. To this date, it holds the world record of noise abatement performance, and it has been um, created based on the observation of wave localization, exactly in the picture that I show you over here. So this is another example of it. Now, when I was asked for the first time, now about 10 years ago, uh, what can we say mathematically about localization of waves? My, First intention would be, you know, the first thing we are trying to understand mathematically is to quantify it somehow. What is big and what is small? You know, when you are saying that the wave is large here and small elsewhere, you know, it's still tiny bit bumpy elsewhere. So what does it actually mean to be large and to be small? And in particular, I would like, I wanted to understand, you know, um, some sort of robustness in the system. You want to know that small changes produce only small effects. You want to prove first that in a certain way, if you change the system only a little bit, it's reasonably robust. It's not going to make something dramatically different. This is actually not true in this case. And this is one I, give me a second, I'll turn the sound off. So this is one example to the contrary. You are taking, well, you as engineers, um, so they're taking an airplane. This is at the scale of an airplane. They're adding this small addition, you know, human size to one of the wings of the airplane. You can see it a little bit later. So it's like a vibrating kiss. It's a tiny bit, you know, at the scale of, this is the scale of the wind, you can see it over here. So you would say, you know, it's a tiny bit at the scale of the airplane. And it produces a dramatic localization of vibrations to the cockpit. So this goes bad very fast. And this is one of the examples of, you know, to a mathematician, it's a mystery. I mean, it, you know, the system is supposed to be much more robust than that. So you, your question becomes sort of, you know, when and where eigenfunctions localize or waves localize, uh, how many do, because again, some do and some don't. What are the sizes and shapes of, you know, like where are they going to be located? What are the associated energies? And much more generally, you would like to be able to determine the wave behavior, knowing the disordered environment, vice versa too figure out what was your material if you can observe a certain behavior of waves. And overall, you want to design things sort of to, according to a particular wave behavior. Why is it difficult, aside from you know, all the examples I showed you, why is it difficult on the theoretical level? The problem is that the modern mathematics and physics alike are very well equipped to deal with particles rather than waves. If you sit, for example, in a square quantum well, so what you should be imagining here is a wall, a gap, and then a wall again. If you are a particle, you would be just sitting in the bottom of it and not being able to go right or left. I mean, if you are sort of in a well, you are in a well. If you are a wave, you can go right and left. You are going to decay exponentially, so you are going to go down very fast but you nonetheless can penetrate walls tiny little bit. The waves can go through walls. So the waves can go where, the, where particles do not and this throws your intuition off. What throws your intuition off even more is that there is an opposite effect too. 
So for example, in the aforementioned map of the New York building, so again, you know, black are the buildings and white are the streets. If you are you, or you are a particle, you would be able to go through. It percolates, it doesn't, you know, it's not completely prevented. There is a path from left to right or from anywhere to anywhere else. But the wave would not take it. The wave might be localized to a particular portion, even though nothing prevents the propagation from left to right. Nothing meaning, you know, per percolation-wise, it actually can go through. The waves would not. So there are both effects. The waves can go through the buildings, but sometimes they don't even go through the open spaces. And this, you know, gives, I mean, at large scales, it gives a lot of mysteries. So the Anderson localization in disorder, which is, you know, what I started from, um, again, it's open since 1950s, it's still devilishly hard to confirm. I mean, there would be papers confirming it and papers denying themselves, you know, shortly after. I mean, in particular, localization of life has been published in Nature a few years ago, and then two months after has been uh, recalled from actually several sources. The theoretical work is still non clear as well. I won't talk about what are critical exponents, but you know, there are values for the same exponent. There are predictions of mu equals one, there are predictions of mu equals one half, numerical simulation gives to serve, you know, this is not scientific. And finally, mathematical proofs are very scarce as well. We understand very few regimes, not many. So long story short, to quote Anderson, who sort of was first to suggest the um, Anderson localization, it has yet to receive adequate mathematical treatment and one has to resort to the indignity of numerical simulation. We hope to do it a little bit less and rely on mathematics a little bit more. Um, to give you an idea of what else can happen and why the waves don't behave the way particles do, it's also because of interference. So in the situation where your New York buildings are sort of the dots, the wave would be ricocheting around, right? The wave is not a particle again. So it could go through and diffusion could occur, something that you see over here. It could also go on the, on the circle. It's possible that it sort of doesn't know how to get out of the library because it, it works by very particular rules and it could be lost in the labyrinth of your system. And again, the truth is that both actually happen. And there is a so-called mobility age below which you have localization and above which you have diffusion. So in the system, both of this happens. But how do you analyze it in the situation when all you see is this? When you measure, you see a potential like this, how do you know which way your way would be behaving? And this is where we come. And what we have introduced by now, um, about 10 years ago, is the so-called concept of localization landscape. So this is a solution to a particular partial differential equation. I won't be talking about the equation too much, but the point is that it lets you see the system through sort of putting on the goggles of a wave. It's as though when you look at the system, you see this disordered potential, you see the um, difficult geometry, you see all the centric cases of the boundaries, you see the map of New York buildings, but the wave sees something different. The way it sees the world of, of the same data is actually different from you. And what the landscape let you do, again, it's a mathematical tool. By solving, you know, which is by solving the equation gives you access to this vision of the world from the point of view of the wave. It's like magical goggles. And it lets you see where the, you know, how the waves split the system. So instead of that, you know, bits and pieces of the New York buildings, you see a clear separation into subregions. And you can say that standing waves will be sitting in the particular subregions exactly with the shape. You can see it in 2D here and 3D here. You know what are the energies of the waves. 
and so on and so forth. Given the generality and the difficulty of the problem, it seems all too daring to assume that such a landscape even exists, and yet we claim it exists. It can be computed and mathematically and computationally, and it can be used to understand and predict the behavior of waves in complex, complex systems and to manipulate again at the atomic level the structure of the materials and ultimately to design matter waves. To stop the sound, to hold the light, to sort of create the world according to your dreams, to stop fighting localization and actually use localization. Because the ability to localize a signal is not only an obstacle, it's an immense power. Since we previously could only think of the science and cosines, it seemed that the materials that behave differently are sort of throwing you off your course are actually an obstacle in your endeavor. But the truth is that it's power if you can control it, if you can create it for your desires, if you can control it. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to design materials relying on the localization effect, concentrating the energy. Um, so the, in the situation where the original potential looks like this, for example, so this is the original data, this is what these is give us, the mathematicians come out with the landscape which looks like this. It's still complex, but you can see that the labyrinth is clear. This is the vision of the wave. You can see how to go through the chambers or not go through the chambers. You can see the structure of the chambers. And this is the way that wave sees the structure. Um, I won't go through, I mean, there is a number of mathematical results behind it. I'll just, you know, flash and not go through this. We can understand the geometric structure of waves, as you can see over here. We can understand the energy levels. So the prediction using the landscape versus the energies are on this line. A hint is that a straight line is really good. It means that we are making a very faithful prediction. There are almost no errors. There are almost no deviations from what we have promised. Um, we can do it throughout the spectrum. So by comparison, I mean, I uh, again, I won't give you the details, but in blue is the reality. In green is the best possible before us, and in red is what our theory gives. So it's pretty close. Uh, we can do the transport and semiconductors and many, many other things. I'll show you only one. Um, bit of it which is sort of about mechanical vibration which is a little bit try a little bit easier to understand intuitively and then i'll shoot right through the applications in quantum physics so yet again you have a domain if it's a square you have your sines and cosines everything is uniform if it's something more complex so here white is the boundary so you should be imagining a drum bounded by this white thing your waves could look like this, being in a small bit of an original domain, or could still look like sines and cosines. Which one is it? And which one is it defines your noise abatement wall? Because actually this exact geometry is the exact geometry of this noise abatement wall. So it's very, very relevant question. The simplest way to think about this, though, is not to do complex stuff. And this is something that, you know, was sort of a big achievement of the project when we started doing it, is actually to go to the simplest geometry possible, because that lets you do mathematics. We have discovered that if you are speaking of vibration of clamped plates rather than um, the drums, so something which is somewhat more rigid, it's possible to introduce mechanical localization by sticking one nail into it. So what you should be imagining on this picture is a bench, you know, or a plate of rectangular shape, as you can see on this picture, just a plate, a fixed plate. And uh, if you want to imagine a bench, what I'm doing is I'm sticking one nail in a certain strategically located point of the bench. There is no difference between blue and white, it's just, you know, for your visual. I mean, there is really one nail in this bench. And what we have discovered is that it introduces complete mechanical decoupling at the level of first 200 eigenmodes. 
So through the entire range of the waves that can possibly be occurring in terms of engineering. So without a nail, you have your sines and cosines. With one nail over here, the waves are either strictly on the right or strictly on the left of the wave of the nail. But there is one nail. There is like no stiffener, no nothing. There is nothing preventing you going from right to left. There is one nail strategically and mathematically located in this bench, which introduces a complete separation. So it's as though there is some secret line. Yet again, it's as though the wave sees some secret line appearing across the system. Where does this separation line come from? There is nothing there, there is a nail. So how possibly can it be completely separated? And this is where the landscape comes. This is the CRM. Um, yet again, I'll, I'll skip the details, but the point is that there is sort of one magic solution to one partial differential equation, which is actually a very easy one. It's H equals one for the Hamiltonian H. I, depending on what your Hamiltonian and the system, which tells you that indeed there are certain stiffeners as viewed by the way, that the places where this magical solution is small are the places where your waves will have to dive under. And this defines the geometry viewed from the point of view of the waves. So the first thing we did is we played with two concepts. We played with what we call a plushion and biloplushion with the two operators. But what you should be thinking about is that this is a drum and the gray is the tissue of the drum and there are two nails and there is like a bottleneck and there is a crack in the drum and below is a plate. So the difference between plate and the drum, plate is hard. You know, like plaster walls or, um, coverings of ships or airplanes or your table or something like that. So above is like a soft tissue membrane of a drum. Below is the same geometry, but it's a hard plate, but both can vibrate in principle. So this magical landscape is going to look different. In the first case, it looks like this and it separates the system into sort of two regions. And then the second case of a plate, it looks quite differently. And it separates system into the four region. And all of this is mathematical. And now we look at waves. And indeed, in the first case, they are exactly, you know, confined as we promised in these two subregions. And uh, in case of the bioflash and in case of the vibration of hard plates, it's about the four subregions here. So everything happens faithfully as mathematics has promised. And just shortly after this first experiment, they were immediately uh, checked, you know, with the actual system. It, it actually was almost funny because they have put up the experiments not even talking to us. Um, the system, you know, the system on which the experiments were put up, I mean, you can see it built here, is exactly the one from our paper with this bottleneck and crack and everything because we wanted to check whether this is true experimentally. In short, it is, and you can see it here. But the thing is, you know, like I have never actually imagined this being checked experimentally. I mean, the picture was drawn by hand as a, you know, just different kinds of mathematics. I mean, to a mathematician, if you ask, you know, like what are different types of singularities, I'll say a point is dimension zero, a crack is dimension one, a bottleneck is dimension two. That's what I was shooting for. Never did I imagine that someone would actually go and check. Um, but they did, and it works. And uh, shortly after that, um, actually in, in Geneva, there is a piano producing company which is which started using this. So if you look under the lead of grand piano, actually of any piano, you have certain bars, like it, it looks like, you know, it, it's lined with bars. And the purpose of this bars is to introduce some, break, to break the resonance. It, it actually, there is a point to this. I mean, it, it ensures that your piano sounds correctly. So they are putting these bars according to the predictions of the landscape theory and apparently it comes out better. But all of this, you know, got out of my hands. So this is not here. Um, 
this is another application actually to the uh, molecular vibrations of proteins. So the ones I showed you are, you know, sort of primitive um, vibrations, just, you know, mechanical ones on simple plates. This is now enzymatic activity of proteins. So we are speaking of, you know, tens of thousands of molecules. And same thing, we are predicting the hot spots with uh, up to 200 strands. So that means, you know, either we are pinpointing the correct molecule or the nearby one. And it looks like this. So this is the prediction of the landscape and this is the factual protein. So you can see that the correspondence is pretty good. Um, and another example is of course, back to quantum physics. So now you know the scheme. You have a potential, you have a system, you have a differential equation, whatever it is. The first thing you do is you evaluate the landscape. You know, potential looks, for example, like this. I'm now having a picture of New York map with the height of the buildings, which matter. But that's not what you are looking for as a wave. What you are looking for is this landscape thing. You are separating into subregions according to the landscape. And then you look whether what you promised will happen. So potential landscape subregions. And the answer is yes. The waves are going to be localized exactly where promised by the landscape, repeating it even with the shape. And they have a movie here, but it gets pretty boring pretty fast. I mean, the waves are just going to walk, you know, the subregions for a really, really long time. So it's really faithful to the landscape. And by now there are settings behind it. I mean, we sort of started with observation, but now there are proofs and exponential decay for them to the events and like that. So not only we know what's the separation and the subregions and there's a three-dimensional pictures now, all by the way, done by Doug, who we have discussed in the beginning of this project, in the beginning of this talk. So this is, you know, what landscape predicts, and this is how the eigenfunctions actually sit. You know, the waves are actually localized in the subregions. And another example is uh, it also can predict energy. So this is a game also devised by that. You take a potential, and you want to know not just what is the separation into subregions, where the waves will be, but in which order will they occur? What are the energies? Because there is a, you know, stack order of electrons, I mean, according to the energy. So the question is, which one is where? Where is the first one? Where is the second? Where is the third? And so on. When you look at the initial potential like this, you can't say. It's, it's really too complex. I mean, in principle, where the potential is smaller, there is a bigger probability that the wave would be. But it's also a question of how wide it is and things like this. It's a, it's a complicated system. It's not like it's here or here. I mean, it's sort of shallow and wide simultaneously that you are looking for. But now if you do it in terms of the landscape, you compute the landscape, you take it reciprocal. Don't ask me why again, there are serums behind it. So you look at one over you and now, the energies are going to be exactly in the order in which minimal curve. So the lowest energy one will be where the landscape dives the most, where it's the lowest. The second one is next. The third one, the fourth one. So let's see if I'm telling you the truth. Yes. So this is the first taken function in energy, second one, third one, fourth one. It exactly corresponds to the minimum of the landscape. Same in another system. Again, you know, whatever the minima have predicted. Same in dimension two, with the shapes. So we are observing that, you know, this is the deepest minimum of the landscape. This is the second, this is the third, this is the fourth, and we are drawing the wells with the shape. And these are the eigenfunctions, these are the waves. First, second, third, fourth. You can see that the similarity is uncanny. It's just amazing. And yet again, you know, we also understand exponential decay away from it and things like this. So where does it land? And there is a lot of, you know, accompanying mathematics with this. There are many predictions behind just energies and waves. There are observations of quantum observables and things like this. Where does it land in terms of the project? 
we have three model systems, experimental model systems to check it. In the sort of, you know, order of, um, how would I put it, from going from mathematics to reality in, uh, in slow motion. So the first one is the system of ultra cold atoms, again, led by Lana Spam. So these are outstandingly clean systems. They don't occur in real world. Well, I mean, in real world. It's, it's real world in the sense of experimental physics, but it's not something that stands on your table because it works at non-Kelvins. I mean, you know, the, the fridge is bigger than a room. So, but it's reality in the sense that you can actually put the experiment. Yeah. So they're outstanding, they're clean. They have pure potential. You can, you know, it's at the level where I can give them a mathematical picture of the potential and they can actually place atoms to exercise this mathematical picture of the potential, which is absolutely shocking. Controllable dimensionality, controllable wavelengths, you know, like individual hand and with laser speckles and high temporal resolution, which means that they can observe. I mean, it's in, it's in seconds, it's not in the, you know, tenth, tenth, tenth of a second. So physicists can actually measure them. So they strive to measure the mobility age, the difference between localized and non-localized waves. They try to understand it and things like this. And this is what we are doing within the project. And um, actually this year, you know, a lot has scored twice, not only if it has a Nobel prize, but they have the first measurement of the mobility age in the history and both are in some condensate of cold atoms. And we have theoretical explanation of this. Then there is a system of, indium gallium nitride semiconductors that I talked about a little bit, uh, which is the ones used for LEDs, you know, for your lighting. And I'll concentrate on that in five seconds. And then there is, of course, uh, the organic semiconductors. So the organic are the soft ones. You know, this is the future of electronics. Um, they're soft, flexible, stretchable. So when you think, so the organic ones are, for example, the uh screens of your tvs modern ones or um iphones you know the ones which have soft edges these are coming from organic LEDs. these are organic semiconductors this is also of course uh, solar panels and things like this so all the energy saving um, materials and so on the problem is that they are even more complex than the inorganic ones because again they possess different scales you know that we are talking of molecules, so it's topological problems, and then the problems that you know many effects occur at different scales at the same time. You don't work with atoms anymore; you work with molecules. You work with much more complex systems, which are also dynamic and things like this. And this is led by Richard Friend, who is who was named, you know, who was knighted. He's Sir Richard Friend for his um, contributions to physics in UK. But the only thing, I mean, I know I should be wrapping up soon, and the only thing that I wanted to tell you, just a small glance into what the project managed to do, is in the area of non-organic LEDs, and going back to the energy uh, savings forecast of um, Department of Energy in the United States. So you might remember these numbers from the very beginning. Um, I will tell you that Yet again, the three main obstacles are green gaps. So what is green gap? In order to create white light, you need all three components, red, blue, and green. I mean, you'd say yellow, but in semiconductors is green. And the green is really lagging. You know, this is the efficiency of the blue one. This is the efficiency of the red one. This is the efficiency of the green one. So what's referred to as a green gap is an extremely low efficiency by green LEDs. Another problem is the efficiency droop at high current. So when you turn on the current, it gets even worse. And finally, as I mentioned, you know, the lack of computational models. I mean, realistically, you can not, or people could not before us, account for disorder in a faithful way. Basically, because, you know, you take a billion, you put it to the power three, and no computer is going to be able to handle this efficiency. So that there were no, um, faithful computational models. You could not predict. And we started working between, you know, pure mathematics and experiment without ever being able to do computation first. 
just because there was nothing in between the computers could not handle it. But now within the project, we got the 33% improvement on the green gap. We have 33% higher, I mean, just in the four years, higher efficiency of green LEDs. And we have thousand times faster computations for these other alloys. So now at this point, we can do computational experiments for the first time. Because thousand times faster is doable. I mean, we were speaking of a month before. Now it's, you know, hours. So now it's finally amenable to the computational experiments. And speaking of the energy savings, so on the right hand side, you have the prognosis by from 2017 by the DOE. You could say that, you know, six years have passed, we are in 2023. How are we doing? We should have a projection now. And now I'm going to say the words which you have very little heard in the conversations about energy savings. We are doing much better than predicted. We are already halfway through. We are already at the savings of about 25%, and we are shooting for 50 by 2035. For the first time in the history, for the first time in the history, we have turned the curve down. So this is the energy consumption curve that you can see over here. This is the you know, projection across the years from 1950. For the first time in history, the energy consumption has been turned down in the United States. And I'll finish here. Thank you very much. Svetlana, how can you finish <laughs> this point when all of this is so exciting? Uh, so congratulations on your terrific work, uh, okay. I guess, uh, from all of us. And thank you for this beautiful lecture. Uh, questions from the audience. Don't be shy. <laughs> I can probably stop sharing, yeah, so that I actually see you for a change. Yeah. Come on, that. <laughs> so, Svetlana, um, when did you... Uh, so, you started out as a pure mathematician. Um, with a degree in finance, uh, with a second degree in finance. In particular, yes. <laughs> no, just saying. So uh, you, you're telling us you were kind of a street kid um, uh, growing up in Kharkiv. When did you... So uh, mathematicians, I guess that's some, some, something we often tell ourselves in our ivory towers of, um, of, of research that, you know, maybe a hundred years down the road, this will... Uh, do good for some. Uh, we'll, we'll do some good to humankind uh, effectively. Will contribute to uh, curing uh, cancer, something like that. Uh, but far, far away in time from me. So your research, the research you, uh, your discoveries uh, from you know a few years out of graduate school, uh, they are changing how we think about uh, our technological future right now. I mean, there are many questions I have related <laughs> to this, but uh, when when did you first, uh, when, what f first made you recognize this potential to see? Fr wow. Frankly, it's, I mean, I, I have to give it to my collaborators, <laughs> the physicists in particular, you know, they came to me with this problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, working on, I mean, I, I still am pure mathematician, you know, my job is pro syrup in, in this entire story. So, I mean, they poked me with this problem enough. And um, well, I, I think that anywhere in science, you should have curiosity. As a mathematician, you should retain curiosity. And, um, you know, it just was too, too interesting of a problem not to dive into it. And of course, first I tried, you know, to work on my old project and not go into this too deep. And then it got deeper and deeper as the, you know, the, the scale of the research started growing. But again, to be, you know, to be completely frank, it's a question of, you know, talking to people. And, uh, and when physicists ask me questions, I just, started thinking about them and then you know there is a certain amount of luck that um, this has propagated so far but 
one thing which is not on the luck side, I would say, and why, you know, it's a super exciting to be a mathematician is that the same equation describes all these different phenomena. Mm -hmm. And things that I understand, which are equations, and things which I understand somewhat are mechanical waves, you know, which is what I started presenting here because it's sort of easier to imagine, they work by the exact same mechanism as waves of matter, mm -hmm. as gravitational waves, as, you know, this is this uncanny power, you know, of uh, mathematics, you know, the, as uh, um, Wigner has put it, you know, the ubiquitousness of mathematics, which we neither understand nor deserve. It's, it's really that, you know, like we don't understand it. It's a complete miracle, but it works. The very same equation works for more or less you know, all the way phenomena you can imagine. And similarly, you know, this heat equation of the diffusion and evolution phenomena you can imagine. So I guess my pitch is that it's fun to be a mathematician because the moment you prove a theorem, it's applicable to everything at the same time. Mm -hmm. But, but you so are, there, is, there is luck and there is a power of mathematics. Right? But you are, you're making a point of also talking to physicists. So usually when physicists come along to my uh, department, most of my colleagues and sometimes also myself, we go into hiding. But you are encouraging us to, uh, to keep connecting. Uh, I, I, think, I think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's messy, but... <laughs> But but fun. Okay, and uh, but let me also uh, also emphasize to the audience uh, uh, that this is actually but one strand of your uh, research. You've achieved terrific breakthroughs, celebrated breakthroughs in mathematics, also uh, in in other areas that have yet to uh, find their way uh, into uh, real world applications. Um, well, as, as I said in the very beginning, you know, I, I'm sort of doing it for the, for the same yeah, yeah, mathematics, I, I right, it, for but, the pure but progress, feel, and then I just got lucky. That I feel got... you being, being so modest, somebody, somebody yeah. has to say it, <laughs> and I'd like to be the one. Uh, uh, do, you, do you think, I mean, growing up in Kharkiv, my understanding is in, in, in Ukraine, there's a, a long-standing tradition of physics, mathematics, uh, mechanical engineering, uh, being very closely tied. Uh, it's, I, I believe, often the faculty of mathematics. And uh, so actually my project, my outreach project here in Austria is called MMF, uh, Mathematik macht Freude. But I, I think the same acronym in, in Ukrainian universities has a different meaning, uh, mechanical engineering and mathematics uh, faculties. Is this, uh, have you always been open to uh, this kind of uh, discourse? Do you think your uh, education back in Ukraine has also helped? Um, to an extent. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there is, you know, no question that, you know, education defines us in, in such a variety of ways. And uh, I left pretty early. I mean, I, um, I left right after graduating from Kharkov University uh, and uh, actually I graduated in the somewhat speedy fashion. Um, so I would say it's the university education in part and, um, you know, in, in part my parents used to be physicists or engineers and, you know, probably they have instilled in me some of these questions with, without me realizing it. So I guess this thanks also goes to them. Must be very proud. Students, where are your questions? Come on. <laughs> um. hmm. If you have any ask out loud, because again, I'm not really reading chat, or you know, if anyone could repeat the chat. There's nothing in um, in the chat either. Um, let's see how, how could, what could be our, it's intimidating. <laughs> break. Yes. Well, I can understand that, but you see my, my way of dealing with being intimidated is to, to talk continuously. Uh, um, let's see. Um, hmm. so, uh, you will share your slides with us.
and we will send them out uh, in the announcement for tomorrow's lecture. Um, so maybe uh, it's easier for some of our students to um, uh, to speak to you in Ukrainian. So maybe we can uh, 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 call it. Kick out uh, everyone who doesn't speak Ukrainian. <laughs> we call it a lecture. Uh, uh, we call it a special lecture for the whole audience. Uh, and uh, but I would ask you, Svetlana, Dmitro, uh, 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 and our Ukrainian students to stay behind. Uh, so uh, you can um, um, uh, talk a little bit in Ukrainian. And of course, everybody is welcome to stay on uh, and pick up some Ukrainian on the way, um, um, or just because it's nice, uh, very nice to be in this crowd. Uh, but to everyone else, uh, thank you very much for attending. It's very good to have you. Uh, tomorrow, we are expecting another spectacular uh, lecture, uh, namely by Pavel Edingov. Uh, so he's a Ukrainian mathematician from Kharkiv. He is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute uh, of Technology. Um, he, um, uh, I was a postdoc at MIT. Uh, um, Pavel was on my floor. And uh, um, uh, yeah, what to say, uh, not to embarrass Pavel. Uh, so Pavel is one of a kind and there's no way to stop his excitement or to contain his excitement and he'll, he'll forget everything uh, else while he's talking about mathematics. Uh, except, uh, I think the only thing that can tempt him away are mushrooms. So the, the picture that uh, that is shown on the webpage uh, is uh, uh, Pavel in the flesh. So he has, I guess, at least two major patients in his life, mathematics and mushrooms. Um, how do you feel about mushrooms, Vitlana? I feel uh, liking mushrooms is uh, uh, is a, maybe a Ukrainian thing. I mean, depends on what you mean. I like eating them, <laughs> but you wouldn't stand. I'm not. Eight. I'm not big on going into the forest. So. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very city kid, you know. Like I like cities. I. So Pavel, Pavel, I, 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 I don't. I don't like you know. So I mean, Pavel, I could maybe do it for a change, but you know. Well, you know, we I, can, Pavel, Pavel, I think Pavel Pavel enjoys yeah. mushrooms so much that may be enough for all of us. <laughs> anyway, so it's promising to be a really fun uh, lecture uh, also tomorrow uh, with Pavel, uh, same time as today. And I look forward uh, to seeing many of you there. So bye, uh, many of you. And uh, um, very good to have you. Thank you.